Hey guys, welcome back to my channel. Today we're going to take a closer look at the Interledger protocol. Why do we need the Interledger protocol? How does it work? And why XRP and XOM are going to be widely used through the Interledger protocol? Let's listen. one person will go to a website and be like okay can i pay for this website with lightning uh no sorry we only accept this this other one so really the main problem the reason why cryptocurrencies are not useful for payments today in most cases is that in order to pay someone you have to be on the same payment network the flip side of that is that if you want to accept payments you have to accept a ton of different payment methods because somebody might want to pay you with one of these many options the traditional payment space is super fragmented. So in every country, there's different payment methods supported. And if you're a merchant, you have to support a ton of different options because you don't want to turn away customers if they come to pay with something. The fundamental problem is that payment networks at their core are disconnected. There are different, different payment systems from banks to blockchain systems, mobile money networks, etc., And all of them are disconnected from one another. This has given rise to a lot of people talking about the idea of the internet of value or internet of blockchains or payments or kind of pick your, pick your favorite term, but it's this, this idea of the internet of, of money effectively. And the reason that we talk about that is because what we need is an internetworking system for payment networks. And the, the word internet actually comes from internetworking. So what, the, what we need is a system that just connects up all of these in the background and just makes it work. So I, I let, some people have heard me say this before, but I'll throw it out to the audience. What is Interledger's total addressable market size? All the money. <laughs> nobody, wanted to, nobody wanted to feed it. Um, yeah, it's all the money because what we're really talking about with this idea of the internet of value is creating a single global payment network that connects literally everyone and processes maybe not 100%, but 90 plus percent of all the money. That's what we're talking about. So how this works, uh, apologies for those who already know how it works, but maybe some people could use, could use a refresher and also we've kind of updated the way we think about some of these things. So uh, as Stefan was explaining, ledgers track accounts and balances, but not everyone is on the same ledger. So we need connectors to relay money. And something that connectors also do is they also exchange currencies. So e each ledger has a different currency and connectors are the ones that provide some rate saying, you pay me this much on one system and I'll pay out on another. And so with the red and blue demo that I was showing off, which you can actually try out by yourself, I forgot to mention that. If you go to red.ilpdemo.org or blue, um, you can try it out yourself. So there's actually a connector sitting between those two that's offering to exchange the currencies of those two ledgers. And so in real time, when you want to make a payment, you can ask it for a quote and it says, this is how much it'll cost you. So how do we actually ask a connector to do something for us? You know, if we're, we're there, you know, Stefan is described this whole system where there's connectors and ledgers, but if the connector's just sitting there, how, how do we actually tell it something? Um, so this is what Stefan was getting at before, where you have the hierarchical identifier, the, the address and the amount. Um, and you, you can really think of that as like, imagine you're, you're putting an address on a little packet or a, an, on, an envelope and you want to send that along. And so what actually happens, the way Interledger works, is that the sender writes this little packet and attaches it to a local transfer. So that's a transfer to the connector. Um, and the connector forwards that on. They, they look at the address it's trying to go to, they use the routing algorithms, which we'll get into more later, and they forward it on. They deliver the amount to the recipient. And with that, we can have these short paths or these long paths. Um, Uh-oh. Um, so the question is, can we trust connectors? Um, like, 
there's this party, I'm going to send money to them. Can, are they actually reliable? Are they actually going to forward on my money? What happens if they just run away with it? That's obviously a non-starter. We cannot be setting this great network up where there's like a 90% chance that your money gets stolen every time. Um, so if connectors fail, would we lose money? That's what we have to solve. So we use holds to provide security. I'll explain what that looks like. So when we talk about holds, uh, or th this is what's described in the paper, as we, we're used, used to call it escrow. It seems like holds are actually a better term for it, but uh, the ledgers are the ones that actually provide this. So it's not necessarily, it's in most scenarios, not a third party service. It's just the ledger, kind of like when you check into a hotel and they put a hold on your credit card. Just saying you can't use this money for anything else during, the, during this time. Um, so what they're all about is the holds depend on conditions and expiries. And so when a condition is, a cryptographic condition is fulfilled, that executes a transfer. But if a timeout is reached before it's fulfilled, then the transfer goes back. So the idea is I want to put, put money on hold, and if somebody can fulfill the condition before the timeout, great. They, the money will go through. Otherwise, the money comes back to me. So this is the, the more full view of Interledger, as uh, Stefan kind of briefly touched on. So you have the address, the amount, the expiry, and the condition. So the way the flow works in uh, what's called universal mode of the protocol, uh, funds are committed or put on hold from left to right. I'll just kind of walk through that quickly so you can get a, get a sense of it. So you, you take that same kind of packet format from before, um, and you have the address, the amount, the condition, and the expiry. And so the sender puts their money on hold. So that, that actually means that the, the ledger takes the money out of the sender's account and puts it, puts it on hold so that the sender can't touch it, nobody else can touch it. But it has a condition attached to it as well as an expiry. So then the connector gets the notification that says, hey, you have money on hold. The connector doesn't trust me, the sender, or Alice in this case, um, but they trust that, that ledger to, if they, if they say money's on hold, money's on hold. So then the connector goes ahead and is like, all right, you put money on hold for me, I'll go do the same for you on the other side. So the connector puts money on hold on the, on the next ledger. So at this point, nobody has actually transferred any money, but money is on hold on across all of these different ledgers. So the recipient gets the notification, money's on hold for you. You haven't actually gotten any money, but it's almost here. Um, and so then what the recipient does is they trigger the transfer to execute by fulfilling that original condition. So transfers are then executed from right to left. So it starts with the recipient signs a receipt. This is the, what was agreed upon before. The recipient says, yep, I, this is a cryptographic proof that I got the payment. Since that signature fulfills the condition, that triggers the transfer on the right-hand side to execute. So at this point, the recipient has been paid. Great. So now the recipient's been paid, but this connector in the middle is out the money. They've basically paid out money before actually getting paid by the other side. So they need to get reimbursed. So what they do is when the ledger notifies them uh, or when they get the, the notification that the funds have actually been released, that shows them that same cryptographic proof that the recipient got paid. So they take that and they pass it on. So the connector passes it on to the next ledger. That fulfills the same condition and that, ex that executes the source transfer. And so what happens there is then the sender ends up with this non-repudiable cryptographic proof that the recipient got paid, and that's kind of how this works. And so, in summary, transfers are committed or put on hold from left to right and executed from right to left. And this can happen across any number of ledgers. So now paths can be short or long, um, and they can be long while still being secure. So even if there's some kind of malicious party in the middle, the worst that will happen is the payment will roll back, but they can't actually steal money. So that's what lets us, lets us build this kind of global network of networks or interledger. Hey Evan, how are you? John Whelan is my name. I'm with uh, Banco Santa Lear in Madrid. I dropped the beat. <laughs> um, I, <don't>. I will. <laughs> Uh, question for you. Okay, so we talk about money moving across the different ledgers, but in reality, it's not really money yet. 
it's actually ownership of balances that changes. Mm -hmm. And in order to facilitate the transactions, um, the market makers, the connectors, I guess, need to provide liquidity via pre-funding. And at some point, as uh, payments flow across the network, liquidity on one side or the other side runs out. So we run into the traditional settlement problem that uh, we experience, I think, in all of the um, existing cryptocurrency platforms that are trying to facilitate real currency transactions. Um, have you given any additional thought to what's going to be required um, from a liquidity point of view to actually facilitate the, ki the kinds of future payments flows that, that you're anticipating here? Yeah, so, so there are a number of different ways to answer that. And, and one of them is, um, you know, eventually, maybe one day, all of the central banks will be LP enabled and so on. And so maybe um, payments will just go through that root ledger and everything will be good money. Um, there. Extremely cheap to send money around. It is exceptionally fast. You can send that exact payment in three seconds. Um, and importantly, XRP is very, very liquid. It's traded on over 120 exchanges against over 200 currencies that you can get in and out of XRP with. Um, and oftentimes on any given day, there are hundreds of millions of dollars of liquidity in XRP. So it's useful if you actually want to move value. You, you can move a large amount of value through, through XRP. Oh, it's... Let me try. Do you see IMF holding crypto assets in the future? Oh, sh They're over here. That's easier. You want to take one? Go for it. The first one's for you. IMF. Do you see IMF holding crypto assets in the future? I did not put that up there. Remember, I'm from the legal department. I'm supposed to be very conservative about these things. Um, I, I don't want to go into great details about Maybe the Maybe I should take what the IMF yeah, is going to uh, do. Uh, I think we stunned uh, Ross into silence with that one. For that to happen, okay, under the current legal framework, some country would have to use a crypto asset as its currency. Stella, on Stella itself, you have, you know, tokenization allows you to trade all sorts of tokens. Um, it can be CBDCs, central banks can issue CBDCs on your platform, if I understand it correctly. Um, yeah. Central banks can issue CBDCs on your platform. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, this is the main thing. That <laughs> okay, guys, thank you for watching. Please let me know what you think about the Interledger protocol in the comment section below. Thank you again for watching, be safe, see you next time.